Hey, everybody, show of hands, whose first open source conference is this? Nice. What about first conference ever? Keep raising them. Yeah? Well, my first conference was actually about 10 years ago at ApacheCon. And I was a newly minted committer and did a riveting talk on documentation. <laughs> one of the other speakers, he did this cool presentation around Bluetooth and one of the plugins that we had where you could connect your device over to an Arduino to turn lights on and off and even change the color. I went up to him afterwards and I asked him so many questions that he gave me his Arduino. He gave it to me. This is actually one of the uh, apps I put together that showed a cool, like, light bright experience just from that Arduino. About five months later, I had a slightly larger audience and did a TED Talk. But this time, I met one of the speakers, and he had a job opportunity for me within IBM. So I joined the Cognitive Incubation Lab, which really was using cool use cases around machine learning. Specifically, we were focused on search. So this was back when search was a lot of voice. So beyond just keyword search, it graduated into phrases and sentences and all the additional context behind the search added a lot of information about what the intent was of the end user. So asking, you know, what's the best camera between an iPhone and a Google Pixel, you're probably in a discovery mode, which means you're looking for videos or articles, whereas if you asked how fast shipping was for the new iPhone, you're probably in a buy mode. So let's take them right to that product. We also looked into Apache Mahout. So we'd use math and correlations to understand different events and actions that people were taking. When you added a product to your cart, when you looked at pictures, and then ultimately made that purchase decision, all of that using math, we could correlate what the best recommendation was for individuals to make that purchase decision. Then IoT started playing a part. We used beacons inside venues and stores when users would opt in to sharing their Bluetooth location. You could understand exactly where they were within the venue. We did some really cool stuff, like understanding who you were shopping with. If you were a date night, maybe you'd get an ad for you know, $5 off per pound for your lobster tails. Or maybe it's a group of teenagers. Let's do a buy one, get one free for some ice cream. We used to say that the future of shopping would feel a lot like stealing. You'd go into that store, you'd pick everything you want, and just walk right out. No friction. But the reality is we need a little bit of friction, <laughs> because otherwise someone could take your phone or whatever that identifier is off of you and then buy stuff on, on your behalf. So because we're humans and we have habits, understanding the type of products you buy, the brand of cereal you like, where you typically shop within the store, all that was really interesting information to decide whether we add more friction. What's the anomalies in that shopping behavior? I got to participate in a startup at IBM called Go Fleetly, where we were actually utilizing existing buy online, pick up in store experiences. So being able to have an Uber driver go and pick up your order at Target versus you having to drive to the store to get it. And using sensor information from your cell phone, from the car, being able to understand who was going to be the first shopper to get there. So you could prioritize fulfilling their order versus someone else's. Unfortunately, we're about two years before COVID on this one, but pretty fun experience to work on. And then when that delivery driver gets to your house and they're taking a picture of the package that they're leaving at your front door, you can use image recognition to say, is that Lisa's front door or is that the neighbor's? And then tell that delivery driver, hey, I think you're leaving the package at the wrong place. And then all of this came back together in big industrial use cases with IoT. We, I joined an IoT division within IBM, and we were looking into big machinery, so training the models on a bill of material and user manuals, and then adding those sensor information from IoT about the machine so that big dump truck driver could ask, you know, why'd that light just come on? And then based on the maintenance history, based on the work orders, understanding that maybe the oil's low, or how do we recommend fixing this issue that we're seeing? And all of that ultimately is building out the digital twin of the physical asset. 
And I like to describe a digital twin like a, an ebook. An ebook is a digital twin of a real book. But the power comes in when you add sensor information. So you know when that physical book is being, the pages are turning, and then having as close to the exact change between the digital and the physical thing. We used all sorts of information, like work order information, and created a digital twin exchange, which allowed owners and operators, as well as the people who are manufacturing these big machineries, to be able to share the data so they could be used for training and more machine learning and AI. And this is when I start playing with blockchain technology. You know, blockchain was super expensive back then, writing on chain. So we had to make a decision. When do you write something on chain versus just using a proprietary database? That decision-making process was all part of the fun of digital twins. Then when IBM acquired the weather company, I got to play with six petabytes of data. So much fun. <laughs> Even like utilities and vegetation management was one of my favorite use cases. Did you guys know that it was a $25 billion market size? Understanding when trees are growing into power lines. So we would use satellite imagery to predict the height of trees and then have the work order come out and perform, trimming the trees. You could use precipitation information, how much it rained in a certain area. What is the species of trees to predict that growth pattern? But we could also augment it with some of the work order information to say, well, we probably don't need to spend a lot of money to continually collect that satellite imagery. Instead, know when it was likely trimmed based on the work that was performed. One of my favorite use cases around big data is airline industry, right? Creating that flight plan for the pilot, knowing what altitude to fly to avoid turbulence. This is all the kind of stuff I got to work on. But I was ready for something else, <laughs> a pandemic hit. Like, what else is out there in, in life? What could I work on? And I heard about Web3. Raise your hand, who knows what Web3 is? Yeah, not as many as I thought. So Web1 is all about read, right? Like newspaper articles, getting it out on the internet. Web2 is write, so that introduced social media, this idea that you could create content, share content, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all of that, us creating content. And Web3 is about ownership. So it's that idea that you can take your data with you as new companies spin up. You can have cryptocurrencies and other digital assets that have a monetary value. A lot of people, when they think of Web3, they think of the, the monkey art. <laughs> you spent how much on this picture of a monkey? And it's true that I think the creative side of Web3 is, is pretty interesting. So just for fun, I want to introduce you guys to Tux.ai. So I used Midjourney and just asked it to create a penguin mascot for Linux and as a Pixar character. And then I created an ERC-1155 token, which basically just means it's a soul-bound token. So all you guys, if you, if you want, grab your cell phones out and scan this QR code and you can get your very own Tux.ai. So it's an NFT that's yours, and because it is soul bound, you can't transfer it to somebody else, it's just yours. It's part of our experience. Everybody in this room today is having the same experience. It's part of your digital twin as a human. So I'll give you a second to scan that. But it's, it's scary, regardless of your political beliefs. The fact that anybody with just a sentence can describe a scenario that could confuse people. And this is where I'm excited about blockchain technology coming in. To be able to do verifications, to sign with your crypto wallet that, yes, this was me that took this picture. This was me that's depicted in this image. Or I'm a news outlet that guarantees that I looked into the truth behind whatever this image is. There's so much potential when you start taking blockchain technologies and AI and everything else that we're working on together. Another area we're looking into is token-gated experiences. Imagine after this keynote that we do an after party and only people who have the tux.ai NFT can get in to pull up your phone and show me that you've got it in your digital wallet. That's a pretty cool use case that gets rid of a lot of the scammers and 
everything we're seeing with secondary tickets like Ticketmaster. But what we're all curious about is this next version of AI, of artificial general intelligence, where the machines are smart, where the machines are writing code. And I'd say that the goalposts are moving <laughs> on what the definition of this is. We're already seeing some really cool use cases. There's a IDE, an open source IDE called Syntax, where it's kind of like ChatGPT, where you describe what the smart contract could look like, and it actually creates the smart contract and then deploys it up to the blockchain. I was talking to a friend who's in the VC world, and he said a year ago, VCs, they wanted to make sure that the founders could build the product. You know, could you do it? Are you, do you have the team to build this product? And now they're asking if the founders have the experience to sell the product because it's now so easy to, to create new things together, even with our voice. So me and my husband, we always go out to the same restaurants over and over again, and I just want to be able to say, you know, show me a new restaurant I've never been to before. I want to go tonight at 6 p.m. And then have an Uber driver come pick me up, drop me off at the restaurant, right in time to walk on for my reservation. And this is what AI thinks that the prototype should look like. But when was the last time you were in an Uber and cared whether the driver had an Android or iOS device? Or stayed at an Airbnb and wondered what their disaster recovery plan was? The reality is we're too early with the tech when we're still talking about the tech. <laughs> Ultimately, we need to talk about the use case. What does the tech do? What's it solving? How does it allow us to be more human? Because my talk 10 years ago, and I'll say it again today, is it's really about humans and how we spend our time doing the things we love with the people that we love. So I want to thank you guys all for being here. Uh, I don't think the future is AI. I think the future has always been open source. So take time during this conference, go outside your comfort zone, Make friends with the speakers and the people sitting next to you, and give somebody an Arduino. Thank you.